All right, um, we're going to move on now to chapter 11, which is gases. Now, gases pro, uh, pose an interesting problem in chemistry, and the reason they're so difficult why we have a whole chapter is because, unlike solids and liquids, well, let me ask you, you can figure this out. If, uh, if I have a, a, a liquid sample, and I measure 10 milliliters of water, Okay, and it's in a graduated cylinder. And instead, I, I throw everything out in this cup and I pour that 10 milliliters of water into that cup. How many milliliters of water do I have? Our volume didn't change, right? No matter what container, how I switch the container, the volume didn't change. Um, the difference between, and solids would be the same thing, right? The difference between solids, liquids, and gases, especially, is that gases will always expand to fill the container that you put them in. So it is, if I have like two helium atoms, it doesn't matter if I have them in a little tiny container like the size of a marble or the size of this room, those two atoms are going to spread out from each other and occupy the entire space. Solids and liquids don't do that. So mathematically, it becomes very difficult to keep track of volume, um, size, all that kind of stuff. And also, if I... <coughs> um, well, you will see as we go through here, the pressure, pressure changes, a little bit more pressure, a little bit less pressure, that's going to affect how the gas behaves much more than a solid or a liquid. Temperature has a much more of an effect on gases than it does solids and liquids. Um, so all these things are going to become very, become very important, and we have to analyze them mathematically and keep track of them whenever we're dealing with gases. So that's what this is all about. Um, can you guys see that very well? That picture shows something very interesting. Um, Notice this little guy has a pretty long straw. There is actually a theoretical limit as to the length of the straw that you can make before it stops working. Okay? Um, now it's a, a matter of trying to figure out why that is the case, what forces are acting on this. Um, fortunately, my brother, I have one brother, he's younger than me, but he, uh, he's a dork as well. So whenever we go out places, we can be dorks together. And... Uh, Last time, I was in uh, visiting some family up in northern Indiana. I went to a Bob Evans restaurant, and you can actually find me seeing how long of a straw I can make to drink my soda. Okay, now, if you bring along some duct tape, um, especially, but any tape will be okay, you can actually tape your straws together and seal them up so that you have a continuous straw. So you can actually get up on your table before people start looking and saying bad things to you. Get up on the table, put your drink on the ground, you know, create the straw where you can drink all the way out of your glass. Um, however, there is a point at which, no matter how hard I try, I cannot, cre I can, I can reach a point where the length of straw no longer works. I, I can't suck any more uh, of that straw. I'll explain to you why this is in a minute, but um, just realize that we're, we're going to be dealing a lot with pressures. For those, in, who's in respiratory? Anybody? Nobody. Great. Um, so this is, this is the chapter that would hit home for, for those people, big time. Um, the, uh, notice that the arrows that are flying in here, all these molecules, you know, in our environment, it's full of gas molecules, right? Nitrogen, oxygen, all around you all the time. You know, you can hit them, you just, so you can taste them, but they're, you don't really taste anything, you don't really hit anything because they're so small and spread out from each other. Um, but they're there. And the fact that they're there means that they can exert a downward force. Just like we exert a downward force, gravitation... Gravity pulls our mass downwards, it exerts that force. Um, the same thing occurs with them. And when that happens, they can actually push down on this liquid, right? And if there was, that was cut off there and there was no person sealing the other end, it was just a straw, um, actually, well, it would be better if there was all, imagine this sealed off with co uh, completely everything sucked out of it. There was no air, there was nothing present in this straw, but it was sealed on the other end, okay? If I kept pushing in stuff here, I would see liquid rise up through that straw, right? You see why. Pressure here, if I increase the, the atmospheric pressure and push down on this beverage, that pressure has to sort of go somewhere, right? It has to be accounted for. So if it's got an outlet, it's going to go up through here, and I can push down here and force things up through that straw, okay? All right. <clears throat> this will come back into play here in a second. But first, we've got to identify, just define a couple things. I don't think breathing is anything like you think it is. Okay? Um, we have the false illusion that we can create some sort of sucking force whenever no such force exists. 
So then how does air enter our body? How does air leave our body? Good question. Glad you asked. Um, let's consider what pressure is for a second. We know this to be true. Gas particles are in constant random motion. Everything is in constant random motion. This table right here, even though it's a solid, if I look closely, I had to wake you up a little bit, um, if you doodle and draw flowers over there, the, uh, if you look closely at this table and look down at the atomic level, you will see little vibrating molecules bouncing off of each other. The difference is if I vaporize this table, you would think it ceased to exist, but in fact I didn't. All I did was took all the atoms and spread them all out from each other. So all the atoms that were present making this table have now been vaporized and dissipated and put into gaseous form, and they're out here floating around in the environment somewhere. Okay? Remember, we recycle stuff. We don't create or destroy anything. Okay, so it's a, it's a matter of sort of imagining what level this is occurring. Constant random motion, in the case of a solid, is just vibrating back and forth. In the case of a gas, we're talking all the way across this room, bouncing off walls, going everywhere. Okay? A lot more movement. Now, they're going to hit stuff. One of the fundamental laws of physics is that things are going to continue what it is they're doing unless an outside force does something to change that. Okay? So it's like, I'm going to forever go in this direction. This is what would happen in space. Imagine yourself in space. Imagine if I kicked you so hard, you left the orbit of Earth and went floating out into space, and there you go. You're going to continue to go until what happens? Until you hit something else, or else you're sucked in by the gravity of some giant planet like Jupiter, who knows what. Until you meet some sort of other force, nothing about what is happening to you is going to change, right? Okay, well, in the case of gases, realize that as they are traveling, say that this is their container, they hit that wall, they're going to bounce off of it. They're going to go a different direction, sort of like a pool ball, right, in billiards. Whatever angle it hits, it's going to bounce off the other way. Um, so there for a moment, when it hits the walls of its container, it creates a little bit of a push, right? That push collectively, when you sum it all up from all the atoms and molecules that are involved in that gas, that's what we call the force that this gas is exerting on its container. All right? Now, we are going to call it, it says if we can measure the total amount of force of all of these molecules, okay, how much of those were hitting the surface at any one instant. So if we could freeze time and look and see how many of them were hitting at that given time, we would know the pressure that that gas is on average exerting. Okay? Now, one thing I want, to, want you to note here is what pressure actually means. Pressure and force are two different things. <clears throat> if, um, if she put her hand out here flat, put it out there. If she put her hand out flat, I just want to, that's, that's mine. <laughs> if I took a, a, a giant one-pound piece of lead, we'll say, and I had it in the, like the size of a sheet of paper, it was probably going to weigh more than one pound, but let's just humor me. A one-pound piece of paper uh, that was actually made of lead, so it's not paper, it's a one-pound piece of lead. If I, if I drop that on her hand, it might hurt, right? But if I take that same amount of lead, and it still weighs one pound, and instead I collapse it and cram it all in to something that is that big around, but it's probably going to be about that tall, right? And I have a, a rod of lead that still weighs one pound, and I have her hand out there and I drop it, which one's going to hurt more? This one. Why is this one going to hurt more? more what? Yeah, it actually is more pressure. You're right, by definition. Because it's, to, to tweak your words a little, it's the same amount of force, but in a smaller area. So force, it's pressure it has two, ter two parts, force and area. If I take this one pound piece of lead, regardless of how it's shaped, it's gonna, when I drop it, it's going to contain the same amount of force if I drop it from the same distance. The difference is, the area over which that force is applied. Okay? In the case of that big piece of paper, when it hits her hand, it's going to hit a whole bunch of, a big part of her hand, right? So there's a big area, a big surface area that's, that's, that's being, that, that force is being supplied over. Whereas if I take that rod and I hit it right here, notice how little of an area that is. And you've got the same amount of force. So when you take the force divided by the area, you get a number. Obviously, the smaller the area, that means the smaller the denominator, right? When the denominator gets really small, the number gets bigger, right? So that means that's what pressure is. It's force per unit area. For example, to give you an idea, um, right now what you are experiencing, atmospheric pressure, is about 14.7 PSI. PSI stands for what? I know. Pounds per, think of area, huh? Square inch, pounds per square inch. You are actually feeling... 
If you could imagine taking a, a, like a 15-pound weight and applying all of that weight over one square inch on your hand, that's the amount of pressure you feel actually coming down on you right now. We've just gotten so used to it, we don't, we don't, we don't recognize it anymore. And if that ever changes, any of it ever drops, some, sometimes, uh, I know I do, maybe some of you get uh, like sinus headaches or get headaches associated with weather, weather changes um, and, and things like that. Weather patterns are caused by this shifting in pressure, alleviation or heavier pressures, that kind of thing. We notice that very, very easily, even if it's a small fluctuation. Uh, we've just become attenuated and, and accustomed to that 14.7 pressure that we feel right now. Okay, now that we know a little bit about pressure, let's consider some really mind-blowing stuff here. Blowing, huh? Get it? Um, the uh, <coughs> tornado um, and a vacuum cleaner actually have a lot in common. Um, you think it's just a bunch of swirly stuff, but realize what happens is the climates that we experience have everything to do with pressure changes. And the pressure changes is going to have everything to do with temperatures. Okay? Um, when things heat up, they become less dense. The molecules spread out. Right? It alleviates pressure. It becomes a higher pressure. Or, sorry, lower pressure. Things come closer together. You can increase the pressure of that system. Well, when you've got things moving around, you've got you know, uh, jet streams coming down from the north that are nice and cool, and you've got warm gulf breezes coming up that are nice and warm, and they hit each other. When, it's like making a solution. Um, and, and like mixing oil and water sometimes. You know that they separate, right? Well, you take hot and cold fronts and have them together, that cold air is going to, you've heard of cold air sinks, warm air rises kind of thing. It has to do with densities. When you put two things together, that which is more dense goes underneath that which is less dense. Okay? So when you mix these two things together, you get wind. Mo wind is the movement of our atmospheric molecules. right? And everything moves from a high pressure to a low pressure. Right? Think That's the way the world works. I put my hands together like this. If I take this hand and I'm pushing it together, if I have more pressure, more force with this hand, I can make my hands go this way. The same is true. If this one has more pressure, more force, it's going to go this way. So it, things in nature move from a high pressure to a low pressure naturally. That's, that's like diffusion. Okay? Um, in the case of weather, if it's such a drastic difference in pressure systems when they come together, it could actually cause them to swirl around and move because the movement is so fast and it drops down so much, it can create this sort of cyclical pattern, which is eventually can spiral downward and keep going down and form, you know, like tornadoes and those kind of things. Um, but that has everything to do with the pressure difference. Two pockets of air of different pressures. One sinks very quickly and sort of like, you know, flushing a toilet kind of thing. When it goes down fast, it kind of just spins around. Okay. Um, here's something a little more. I don't know if any of you have ever, anybody ever been through a tornado in here? Like set through one, seen one, whatever. Um, I had a student once who tried to describe it. This was back when I taught high school, but she was she had a house that was actually down where we used on the end of the farm where we used to live on, and uh, there's nothing there now except some foundation. That's it. Um, she said it was like a freight train was going full blast, drove right over the top of her house, and then she looked up and her house was gone. There's nothing there. All that was left was her cement walls. And that's pretty scary. But you know, we start messing with stuff like this. And it really makes you appreciate the fact that we. We think we have control over things. We look at these weather maps, and we think we can predict all this stuff. And ultimately, we are often put in a place where we realize very quickly we don't know as much as we thought we did. Powerful thing, Mother Nature. But anyways, the vacuum cleaner. This is sort of interesting because you hopefully use this more frequently than you see a tornado. Um, the, uh, if you're sweeping, what people often believe is that you've created this suction force in your vacuum cleaner, and you can go by and go on top of this dirt, and it just sucks it up. That's the completely not the way you're supposed to look at this. That's not even what happens. What happens is you have a motor, electric motor, that compresses and rotates the air that's inside this, this vacuum cleaner, inside the bag or the tank or whatever. And it creates, by increasing the velocity of the air, it creates a lower pressure system. Okay? This is some neat stuff we could get into Bernoulli's principle, why these giant planes can fly. You ever wonder about that? Like these giant hunks of metal are in the sky. Why can they fly, but I can't? You know? um, <clears throat> remember what I said about quantum mechanics. If you think you can, you can. Whether you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. Okay? Um, but anyway, so don't tape that to yourself, though. 
don't take that note to you whenever you jump off the building and say, Dear Jim, <laughs> I guess you were wrong. <laughs> the, uh, anyways, if you're, uh, if you're sweeping, realize you create this uh, uh, a vacuum. And what a vacuum means, by definition, is an area either of no pressure or a very, very low pressure compared to what's going on around it. Okay? So if you create a, a machine that within it has a very, very low pressure, far below what you feel right now, atmospheric pressure. And you can do that by speeding up the air that's inside of it. Okay? That means when I push something, let's say this is a, a piece of dirt or whatever, as I bring this machine over the top of this, and inside it is a very low pressure system, what happens to all the atmospheric gas that's right around it at any given time? Where do you think it's moving? It's, it's flying right in. Okay? This is not sucking anything in. It's creating a very, very low pressure system so that naturally all of your atmospheric gases all around it are just flying right in there. They're getting sucked in because naturally, according to the gradients, you flow from a high pressure to a low pressure. So that means anything in the way, this is such a, a drastic difference that the air moves very quickly. So since air is actually matter, we don't think of it as that, but it is. It's matter. It's got a lot of atoms and molecules in it. When enough of it flies through with enough force, it can knock things that's in its way, take it with it, right? It can, if air is moving this direction, there's no reason that that air is hitting that and pushing that in that direction as well. It's actually a pushing force as opposed to a sucking force. People don't realize that, okay? Um, so it's pretty interesting. <clears throat> that's how a vacuum cleaner works. Interestingly enough, so you can read that last bullet there, um, but interestingly enough, this is also sort of how you breathe. I don't know if you ever think about that. There is no sucking force in your breath. You do the same thing. Um, I'll explain it in a minute, but you change the volume inside your body so as to decrease the pressure. And when you decrease the pressure below atmospheric pressure, guess what happens? Air rushes in. When you decrease your volume and increase the pressure on the inside of yourself above atmospheric pressure, guess which way the air goes? Out. Okay, so it's a little bit different than what people think. Okay, so take this example. Um, <clears throat> here's a beverage with a straw. If, uh, if everything was perfect, and this was an open container where the atmospheric pressure could come in here and push down on this, but at the same time, obviously since the straw is open, it could push in there, right, and push down there as well, because this is open to the environment. Notice these arrows. PATM stands for atmospheric pressure. It's all about the same. So you should see no liquid movement in this situation. Now, in reality, though, I don't know if you're catching this or not, but if you go to a restaurant and you order a Coke or whatever, you put your straw in there, you will notice that the fluid level rises up a little bit in your straw. It doesn't stay level with the drink that you're drinking. It actually goes up about that far or so, right? I'll explain that. That has nothing to do with pressure. That has to do with inter what's called intermolecular forces, um, the attraction between the water molecules, for example. I'll explain that in an upcoming chapter. Um, but for right now, ignoring that, this is what you should see, right, if everything was perfect. So how do you make it move? How do you suck something out of a straw? It's amazing, too, how, how people learn this. You ever, you ever you remember when your kids, if you ever watch your kids when they learn how to drink out of a straw? I don't know if any of you have, how many of you have kids, but like my youngest, my son I was talking about, he, he finally just learned how to drink out of a straw. Do you realize how complicated that is? I mean, just the fact that they, at first they're just kind of sitting there, they don't realize it, and all of a sudden they, they make this, that, that one time where they, they the physiology all kicks in all at once, and they realize what they've done, but yet what's even more amazing than that to me is the fact that you're able to remember how that works and do it again, and you formed an instant memory. That's incredible. But anyways, um, if you imagine this, now that you seal this other end, okay, it's not open to the environment now, so you don't have equal pressures coming from both ends. If you can figure out a way to make that arrow smaller, in other words, if you can figure out a way to lower that pressure, that's what we do when you swallow, okay? I don't know if you really think about it, but when you swallow, you set into effect some, some similar muscles, um, sort of similar to respiration, that when you bring them back, you're going to end up um, vacating some of, the, especially in your mouth, vacating some of the, the gases that were in your mouth that were the left over from breathing. Bring those back, push everything, expand the volume, and create a lower pressure situation is what you do. So what you end up doing is dropping the pressure inside the straw, like by letting it expand more, you drop that pressure so that now these arrows that are, that are pushing down on this drink are pushing down harder 
than any pressure that's standing inside this straw. So where does the fluid move? It gets pushed up and goes up through the straw. And with enough of a difference in pressure, you can make it rise all the way up to your mouth and drink it. Okay? Once it gets up there, gravity takes in and it just goes back down the other way. Um, now, as far as, and that's what I just explained, but as far as what I said at the beginning, why is it that you can only have a straw that's a certain height? Well, number one, yes, we are limited by human physiology. Um, we can only create a pressure differential between us and our outside environment of about 4 millimeters of mercury, anywhere from 4 to 6 millimeters of mercury. In other words, I'll explain those units in a minute, but a very small, just enough to where air will rush in and air will rush out if we need it to. Realize that, obviously, the higher this is, what happens is as fluid starts to accumulate in this tube, the fluid itself becomes our problem. Because as it starts to accumulate, it increases in its mass, and thus the gravitational pull on it increases. And it's like the amount of force that is necessary to move a standing column of water becomes even higher and higher. You have to have more and more force, more and more difference in pressure once that starts to accumulate because it starts to stand. And that standing water has pressure associated with, with it just by virtue of the fact that it's matter pushing back in this direction. Think of it like in the pool. When you dive in the deep end and you go way down, you can feel that, right? The pressure changes. As water is stacked on you, as fluid is stacked on you, the pressure increases significantly. The same thing is happening here. So you're fighting against that which you are actually moving in this case. Um, so what we'll find is, even without human physiology, okay, um, if I it, realize that you know, I was able to use a straw, say, about three to four feet long, we can probably add a few more feet on that and still make it work. But when you get a straw that's like 25 feet long, it is possible to move things through that straw, but not with a human, because you don't have enough pressure differential that you can generate with your parts to make that happen. However, if I take a vacuum pump, and what that means is I can hook it up to a pump that can create such a, a big pressure difference compared to what our body can, to the point where I can completely eliminate all gases present and make it zero pressure on the inside, even then, I could not have a straw, I could not have a tube drawing stuff through any higher than 10.3 meters, a little over 30-some feet. And the reason is because at about 10.3 meters, you have enough water um, that, is, that the, the pressure generator or the fluid, whatever generated by that fluid, is about the same as atmospheric pressure. So the pressure exerted by this, this high of a column of fluid is the same as the pressure exerted by our atmosphere. So that means there's no different and there's no more movement occurring. So you can't, you can't make that happen. Um, okay, something interesting here. I told you already that our 14.7 PSI is the average atmospheric pressure. It's interesting to note that about 80% of this is in the first 10 miles of our atmosphere. Um, so you'll find that the density of all these gases that are in our atmosphere occur very close to the Earth's surface, and it becomes less, less dense as we get farther away. Um, <coughs> you can even notice this um, if you go really high. Like I'll, I'll talk about this in a minute, but like flying in a plane or uh, climbing a big mountain, there's a big pressure difference. And realize that breathing has everything to do with pressure. So it gets harder to breathe the higher you go. Because what you, think of it, what you've got to do is, is drop um, your, to inhale, you've got to drop your internal body pressure below atmospheric pressure, right? So that the, the, the air out here wants to come in. Well, when that atmospheric pressure starts to decrease and becomes even lower, look how much lower you have to drop your inside, right? If you drop it just a little bit like, like you have been doing, breathe like normal, it's not as big of a difference as it was when you were standing down here on the ground. So that means it's harder and it's slower. That gas is going to move in more reluctantly and more slowly, and it's going to be harder to breathe. You need this perfect balance that we have right now to, to make this happen. Um, now, there are adaptations, um, you know, alpacas, stuff like that, and things that and some of these mountain goats and things that live uh, in a little higher elevation places, they can actually pack in more red blood cells. Their blood is more viscous. Um, so they can carry more oxygen in their blood than what we can carry to help adapt situations like that where it's harder to breathe a little higher up. Um, okay, anyways, some properties of gases that you need to know about. Some pretty easy stuff. Number one, they will always expand to fill their container. Okay, no matter what your container is, they will always fill it. 
They will always take the shape of their container, obviously. They have a very, very low density, compared, to, especially compared to solids and liquids. They, they're spread out from one another a lot. They are compressible, evidenced by the fact that you drove here today. Uh, if, we, if you couldn't compress the fuel in your, in your automobile cylinders, then you wouldn't have had the energy to supply to your wheels to drive you here. Um, and mixtures of gases are always homogeneous because they mix together so well because these things are bouncing around of, around each other all the time and they mix up really, really well. And they are fluid. They flow. They move past one another. Okay, this you have to know. Know the parts of what's called the kinetic molecular theory. Big words, what does it mean? Kinetic means what? It could, it could mean energy whenever you say kinetic energy, but what does it mean? Movement. Okay? So kinetic energy is the energy of movement. So you're not completely wrong there. Um, kinetic is movement. Molecular, we know what molecules are. So we're talking about the theory of moving molecules, in other words. It just doesn't sound as good, so we call it kinetic molecular theory. Here's what you need to assume. Now, these are not perfect. These are not absolutely true, but we have to have somewhere we just say, okay, we're going to assume this is true so that we can study things. The particles of the gas, whether it's atoms or molecules, doesn't matter. Like krypton, for example, would just be atoms, but chlorine would be molecules, right? It has two chlorines stuck together. Are constantly moving. That's the first step, or first assumption. Also, the attraction between particles is negligible. If I have a, a, a flask of chlorine gas, I am assuming that this chlorine, Cl2, this Cl2, they bump into each other, and they're not, like, attracted to each other. They don't form some sort of bond with each other. They're already stable the way they are. Okay? And when they do move, they don't hit each other, and they don't stick to each other. They hit each other, but they don't hit and stick. Uh, they don't form these bonds. They don't cause energy breakage or anything like that. Um, they bounce off and continue moving in all directions, sort of like the lottery machine balls, right? They, they just keep bouncing. They're bouncing around in there. Think of it sort of like that. Also, there's a lot of empty space between gas particles, okay? There's a ton of space, especially when you compare it to the size of the actual particles. Okay, see if you understand what this means. The average kinetic energy of the particles is directly proportional to the Kelvin temperature. What does that mean? Yep, when temperature goes up, the amount of energy possessed by each molecule generally goes up on average. Okay? Um, so generally what, you, what that means is as, as, when energy increases, motion is going to increase as well. You're going to stir these guys up and they're going to want to move around more. Um, <coughs> the, what is important to note here um, is this last step. Don't be fooled into thinking. This will come back a little bit later, but... Don't be fooled into thinking that when you increase the temperature of something, or sorry, increase the amount of energy uh, supplied to something, and you measure it by taking its temperature, don't assume that like whenever you assign an energy value to a sample, that every single molecule in that sample has the same amount of energy, because it doesn't. You are taking an average. It's just like us. Obviously, we all have different levels of energy in here today. Right? I'm stoked because we're talking about chemistry. You guys, not so much. So when we average it all together, we can get a value that's not necessarily indicative of each person, but just as a whole. Okay, so that's, that's what the temperature reading actually is. All right. So here they are, just a summary of those things. Make sure you can recognize those and you know what the parts of the kinetic molecular theory are. Okay. I um, already said this, so I'll glance over that real quick. I'm not going to say anything about that. No definite shape. No definite volume. They're going to change according to their container. I like this slide for the visual learners. Gases are compressible and have low density because of the large spaces between the molecules. Okay? Come on. That was clever. You know it was. Um, <clears throat> a lot of space between molecules. Okay. I don't need to go over this. It's kind of just driving home the same point. I think you get it. Realize here is compressibility. Here's a liquid. Notice that a liquid is not really that compressible. Um, you could argue that it is a very, very small amount, but there is a space between molecules that theoretically could be eliminated in a liquid. Um, but there's a reason that it's the way that it is. We'll learn about uh, liquid forces and stuff like that in a subsequent chapter. Um, but you can see there's definitely 
not as much space as what there is over here. It's very easy to compress a gas compared to a liquid. Okay. Something interesting here, the density, uh, like I said, is, is very different. Gases have a very low density to the point where if you can imagine one can of pop, and if you took the liquid that was in that one can of pop and vaporized it and turned it into a gas, just let it expand like it normally would, um, you could fill 1,700 cans of soda same amount of, of matter if you had it in gaseous form as opposed to liquid form. So there's a huge difference. You know, solids are much more dense than liquids, but liquids and solids both are way, way, way more dense than gases. That's the point of this. Okay. Now, take a look at these pictures real quick, and I want to run through a couple things that's going to lead into our gas walls that we're going to talk about. Um, <clears throat> Take these two situations, and one thing, don't look at the words, just look at the pictures for a second. What is, let's say these jars are the same size and this is the same type of gas. Okay? And notice that this one's labeled as higher pressure, this one's labeled as lower pressure. What is the big difference that you see between these two pictures? There's more. That's exactly right. So one of the things that we can safely assume is that the volume, or not the volume, but the number of particles. Okay, the actual number of gas molecules is going to play into the pressure, right? The more, in general, generally speaking, the more gas particles you have, the higher the pressure is going to be. Okay. Um, so that's what this bullet is about. The pressure of a gas depends on several factors. Number one, how many gas particles are in a given volume. Number two, the volume of the container. Um, if I took this guy right here, okay, take a look. If I if I took this container. And next to it, I gave myself a container that was twice as big, okay, whatever. Um, and I took the same amount, right, of these guys right here and put them in that container. Which one of these two containers is going to have a higher pressure? This one's going to have a higher pressure. So what can you say about volume? Okay, but re relate pressure and volume. The smaller the volume, the greater the pressure, right? Okay, so we start seeing relationships here. We start seeing what one relationship is the more gas particles present, the higher the pressure. Generally speaking, the smaller the volume, the higher the pressure, okay? What if I took this guy right here, okay, this container, and I duplicated it and made an exact copy right next to it, so they're exactly the same, but I put a Bunsen burner underneath this one, and I heat this one up. Which one's going to have a higher pressure? The one with the flame underneath it. Okay, you're supplying more energy and speeding up those molecules that are going to create more collision, higher pressure. So what can you say about temperature? Generally, temperature does what to pressure? Increases it, usually. Okay. Now, I'm going to define this more specifically uh, in the upcoming equations that we're going to use. So the volume of the container is going to play a role, the number of gas particles present, the average speed of the particles, which could play also into, as a result of temperature. You've heard of this, right, a barometer. You watch the news, and the barometer is always rising or falling, right? And they give you this number that's usually around 29 or 30 or 31. No one really knows what it means. They just know that it should be right around 30 somewhere not, Kevin gets very upset. Um, <clears throat> it's good to know exactly what's happening, though. Um, there is an uh, Italian physicist slash chemist named Evangelista Torricelli um, that uh, came up with the first barometer. And what he did was actually very clever. Took a little pan of mercury. Why he used mercury? Mercury is very dense. It is a metal, right? So it's it's going to stay in one spot. Everything else is a solid on the table, and most things are a gas. Very few things are actually present as a liquid or a solid. Bromine can be present as a liquid, um, which isn't all that good, especially given its toxicity. Um, but mercury seemed a perfect choice because it's very dense. It's a metal, and it's a liquid at room temperature. So um, it's going to take a lot of oomph to move mercury, but at the same time, it will move. Okay? So he took a pool of, of, of mercury, a little dish, took a tube, inverted it, it was a vacuum tube, all the air had been removed from it so that there's no pressure, 
exerting on the inside of the tube. And wanted to see, knew that there was pressure coming down, based upon all the other natural laws that have been observed, wanted to see if there was a way to measure how much pressure was coming down on us. So it goes back to that straw kind of thing. There was atmospheric pressure, and what he saw was it, it would cause the mercury to be pushed up through this tube, and it would raise a certain amount. There he goes, the first barometer. Okay. Barrows means pressure. Um, notice that 29.92 inches was what the average, after you convert it, he actually measured it in millimeters. Okay, that's a conversion from 760 millimeters. 760 millimeters of mercury is one of the first and uh, most important measurements of atmospheric pressure uh, because what he did was took this tube and notched little millimeter marks in it, tiny little marks like on the side of the ruler, and would measure how high that mercury column got. And on average, typically, uh, what happened was, it was somewhere around 760 millimeters, which when you convert that over is about 29.92 inches. So that barometer reading that you see on the weather is actually uh, inches of mercury. And you can monitor whether it's falling or rising. And obviously falling and rising has to do with whether the gases are increasing their pressure on us or alleviating their pressure on us, and that's going to drive weather patterns. Okay? Um, typically, you know, high pressure systems are things that are coming down on us, and as they come down, gases are coming down, you're going to get, you know, uh, precipitation can feed in and out of that and all that kind of stuff. I'm not a climatologist. I don't know how it all works, but um, I do know that it's everything to do with pressure. You get recycled air. High pressure systems come in, displace lower pressure systems, things cycle up, things fall back down. Ergo weather. Um, but anyways, um, the 760 millimeters is sort of our standard that we go by as a tribute to him. Now we have much different ways, more sophisticated barometers. We have uh, other units we use to measure, but this is how it all got started. Um, <coughs> they keep sick down there. Um, so atmospheric pressure then was defined as became defined as 760 millimeters of mercury. Anybody in the healthcare field, you know that your blood pressure cuff or your sphygmomanometer, um, 120 over 80, you know, typical blood pressure, whatever, that's actually in millimeters of mercury. That's a, that's a pressure measure. That's, that's how it's displaced. Um, <clears throat> all right. The, uh, notice this. I mentioned this a minute ago, but the higher up you go, the less the pressure is. Um, at the surface, for example, of the Earth, you're feeling right now about 14.7 psi. Now, you go up a couple miles, 10,000 feet or so, you're only at 10 psi. So when you're flying in a plane, it's very important that you have a pressurized cabin so that the oxygen that you breathe is pressurized properly and all that kind of stuff, or else it becomes very difficult to breathe. That's why if you climb mountains or whatever, you generally have to take an oxygen tank with you so that you can increase the pressure of the air that you are breathing so that outside so it will come rushing in. Otherwise, you won't be able to bring it into you. Um, now, uh, to help explain a little bit and how it works, I thought everyone should know why their ears pop. You guys all experienced that, right? Like going up in the mountains, going back down, flying on an airplane, your ears pop. What is that? Interesting. Um, if you take a look here, I can't tell. I thought there was like, is that a whole bunch of hair on there? Oh, well, anyways. The. Um, if you look up here in your, uh, in your ear, it's, for those of you who have taken anatomy, you, you, you know this already, but you, you have a tympanic membrane, you have your eardrum that separates your inner and your outer ear, right? This works by collecting sound waves. It vibrates it like a snare drum, okay? And it starts to vibrate, and that vibration passes along to these three bones. It hits your oval window, transfers into your, your cochlea eventually, and where it's filled with fluid, and, it, and it, those vibrations turn into like compressions on fluid that creates a wave. And that fluid wave pushes and bends little hairs, and when it bends those hairs, it sends nervous impulses to your brain, and you hear things. You turn that into a sound. Well, anyways, we have a, a tube right down here, right, the eustachian tube, that actually is a vent, so to speak, uh, from your inner ear down into your, th well, I'll say your throat, for lack of a better anatomical term. Um, it's a pressure stabilizer is what it is. It helps keep the pressure constant on the inside and the outside of this eardrum. Um, you know, like in little kids, you can get, well, even adults, but especially in little kids, ear infections. Um, the, a lot of times, like in small children, this tube is, as we grow, it becomes more vertical, more up and down. But as you're a small child, it's actually more horizontal and shorter. 
So it's more prone to infection anyways. And once you get an infection in there, you're, more, you're prone to more infections. Um, but uh, if an infection happens like that, you can get blockage and you get a lot of uh, uh, problems with not only drainage, but you get from the, from the infection, but you get a lot of problems equilibrating pressure inside and outside the ear. It could lead to hearing problems. Um, and I'll explain why. But sometimes you have to, you've heard of like tubes in your ears and things like that. They have to go in and put a tube in so as to let that pressure um, sort of be able to equilibrate on both sides so it doesn't build on either, especially in here, because that tube is blocked or it's scar tissued or something like that. Usually they work themselves out. Sometimes they have to be removed. Um, but anyway, my point is, if you take a look at this, we do have, because of that tube, um, we have dead air in our mouth and in our lungs and in our esophagus, or not our esophagus, our trachea and um, our, uh, our nasal cavities and all that kind of stuff. So we do have a pressure in our sinus cavities and things like that that is probably equivalent somewhat to atmospheric pressure. So that's what these molecules represent back here. A certain pressure that's inside there already behind this, air, this, this eardrum, this membrane. When you go up really high, realize that on the outside of you now, the pressure drops considerably. That means there are, f for any given area, there are fewer gas molecules, right? There's not as much pressure forcing in now as there once was. So what happens to you is that pressure, there's more pressure on one side, so it bulges. It actually pushes, in this case, that direction and bulges your eardrum out in that direction. And that's that popping feeling that you get. And the reason that you can't hear very well is because what you need to realize is that in, in, in order for a vibration to occur, the pressure has to be equal on both sides. Think of a drum, a drum head, right? If you had a whole bunch of pressure pushing up the bottom of the drum, and when you hit it, it's not going to vibrate. It may thump or something, but it's not going to vibrate. You've got to have equal amounts of pressure on both sides so that the only thing that causes the movement is the sound wave that comes in, not the pressure from the air. So if you've got a bulge, if a sound wave comes in, it's like it's just hitting something that's dead. It can't vibrate because there's too much pressure on the backside preventing it from vibrating. So you don't hear very well either. If you swim and you get water in your ear, it's sort of the same thing in reverse. You've filled up this area right here. Um, that gets, if water gets stuck in there, you've applied more pressure on this side going that way, and you can't vibrate as well. So that's why you can't hear very well for, for a moment. Uh, anyway, I thought that was interesting. So I think everyone needs to know that. It's not really popped, of course. Obviously, it could on terrible circumstances. You can imagine if you load it up and never let anything vent, and you went up really, really high, really, really fast. I, I suppose, in theory, that could, that could certainly pop. But. As far as the different units um, to measure here, this is what was used as a definition, Okay, our uh, 760 exactly. I know he measured it, but because it fluctuates so much, <coughs> what scientists decided to do excuse me, <coughs> was just say, let's pick a definition. Atmospheric pressure never remains constant. It's always fluctuating. So let's pick a point in the middle that seems very constant that we'll have as a reference. So they say, fine, by definition, the number, the pure number, 760 millimeters of mercury, that represents atmospheric pressure. Okay? So then there's other units that you will run across, depending on what it is you do for a living. You'll run across different ways to measure pressure, and these are all the things that are equal to one another. So guess what you can use this for? Conversions, you bet. Okay. 101,325 pascals is the same as 760 millimeters of mercury. 760 millimeters of mercury is also the same as 1 atm, 1 atmosphere, which is the same as 14.7 psi, which is the same as 760 tor. Notice these two are the same. Why? Because I don't know why. Um, 760 millimeters of mercury, and scientists thought that's too boring. I don't want to label something millimeters of mercury. Let's pay tribute to the guy who discovered this. So let's say each millimeter of mercury is called a tor after tor itself. So 760 tor is the same thing as 760 millimeters of mercury because one tor actually is one millimeter of mercury. Don't ask me, just accept it. Okay, so these are all conversion factors that you'll have to deal with, assuredly. I'm going to do this problem, then we're going to take a quick break, and then I'm going to do a little bit more. Um, a high-performance bicycle inflated to a total pressure of 125 PSI. What is the pressure in millimeters of mercury? What do I need to know? How do I convert? Uh, well, I could do it that way, but if I, you're right. But if I look at my table, I don't really see anything with 1 PSI, but I do see something with 14.7 PSI, right? 
So I can say 14.7 PSI is equal to what that I need to know here? That's right. 760 millimeters of mercury and 14.7 PSI are the same thing. So I'll use that as my conversion factor. So let's set it up like so. We're going from PSI to millimeters of mercury. I'll use that conversion factor according to my table. So now I just plug in my numbers. 125 times 760 over 14.7, and I get that number. Now for sig figs, realize I said that was a perfect number, right? Because I told you that they decided his was going to be the reference point. That's obviously a measurement. It's a decimal point. This is given in the problem. That's going to be a measurement as well. So I'm limited to 3 in this case. Okay. All right, questions about that? It makes sense then, since you know that there's 14.7 there's PSI is equal to 760 millimeters of mercury. So obviously the units of millimeters of mercury are much, much smaller, right, than, than PSI. So that makes sense whenever you can convert this. You can sort of make some logical sense out of like what, what this answer means. All right. Picking up now with Boyle's Law. Um, Robert Boyle stated some pretty common sense things that make sense. But since he wrote it down, he gets credit for it. That's the way it works. What Boyle's Law states pretty much is this. See if you can decipher this. The pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. What does that mean? Pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume. Helps to know what inversely proportional means. What does it mean? That's right. When one goes down, the other goes up. That's what inversely proportional means. So, if I say the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to its volume, what am I saying? Gas goes up. What do you mean? Okay, if the pressure is increasing, it's because the volume is decreasing, right? And vice versa. Now imagine that. That makes sense, right? If you have a container and you have a, a certain pressure associated with it, realize if I make that container bigger and I give the molecules more space, I'm alleviating some of that pressure, right? So by increasing the volume, I am thereby decreasing the pressure. That's what Boyle's Law states. Um, don't worry about this, this graphing stuff right now. Um, it's kind of beyond where we need to go. Just understand the, the, the concept of, of one goes up, one goes down kind of thing right now. Um, but what's important to note is that as P increases okay, and, and V decreases, like we just said, but it's by the same factor. And what that means is if I take my volume and I double it, by, so I, I've, I've changed it by a factor of two, right? I've taken my volume and I've doubled it. Guess what happens to the pressure? Not doubled. It doesn't go up. It goes down, right? If volume goes up, pressure goes It actually gets cut in half, okay, by a factor. So it, it decreases by a factor of two, which means cut in half. So if I quadruple the volume, I've one-fourth the actual pressure in doing that. So that factor remains the same. Okay, um, this explains how this works, by the way, if you've ever used a bicycle pump. What it is basically is just a cylinder on the inside, as you can see here. And when it's down on the ground and it's closed, you pull it up, right? And you pull it up so the air goes in it. But realize why air goes in it. Because when you pull it up, you are increasing the volume, right? When you increase the volume inside this tube, what have you done to the pressure? You've dropped it, right? You've decreased it below atmospheric pressure. So guess what? The gases from the environment are going to flow in through this one-way valve. It's usually on the bottom, but there's a little tiny valve. It doesn't have to be very big. When you decrease the pressure lower than atmospheric pressure, air goes in. Okay? It's a one-way valve so that when it goes in, it can't go back out. It kind of closes behind it kind of thing. So now it's full. So now you can hook it on your bike tire or whatever and then start pushing down. What happens when you are pushing down? You are decreasing the volume, right? As you decrease the volume, what happens to the pressure? It increases. The goal here is to increase the pressure that is above and beyond the pressure that's inside the tire right now so that the air flows from high pressure to low pressure. It will flow out of here and into the bike tire. Now, you know that if you keep going and you keep going, there's a point where you just can't push it anymore and you meet total resistance. Now you have, you have equal pressures on both sides of this. The pressure has built up to the point in the tire where you cannot generate enough pressure within that pump to push it to create a pressure difference gradient to make it flow from one place to another, no matter how hard you try. Um, 
sort of interesting. All right. So whatever P times V is, whatever value you get for your starting pressure and your starting volume, if you multiply those two together, you get a number. What you will find is that when you're done and you change the pressure and the volume changes accordingly, you'll have two different numbers. But guess what? When you multiply them together, you get the same number that you started with when you multiplied the first two together. Okay? It remains constant. The P times the V remains constant. So that means if you have P1 and V1, starting conditions of pressure and volume, and then you look at your final conditions of pressure and volume, the P1 times V2 should be equal to this P1 times V1. The number should be the same. I'll show you what I mean. Um, if you look at some of Boyle's actual data, if you have a pressure of 29.13, regardless of what the unit is, it doesn't matter right now, pressure of 29.13 and your volume is 48, 48 whatever. Okay? Multiply those two together, you get 1,400. If you decrease the volume from 48 to 42, what you will see now is a new pressure measurement. And if you measure it to be 33.50, what you should see now is if you multiply these two together, you get the same number as what you started with. These numbers are constantly changing, but they're doing so in a very mathematically proportionate way so as to when you multiply them together, you always get the same answer. Okay? They, they stay together. Does that make sense? Do you see what I'm saying here? And that becomes important because it allows us to predict final conditions according to initial conditions kind of things. I'll show you what I mean. But to give you an idea here, if I take this cylinder that has uh, gas in it, volume of one liter, and if I cut that volume in half to 0.5 liters, push it halfway down, notice my pressure gauge went from 1 to 2. Okay? So it's like what we just said. So how do you breathe? Okay? Um, <clears throat> realize that our brain stem controls our breathing cycles. We don't have to think about it, fortunately. Uh, we can if we need to, but most of the time we just... The whole muscle uh, integration and everything is, is taken care of for us. But at some point, nerve impulses are sent. It can monitor CO2 levels, increase breathing rates, and all kinds of things like that. But at some point, uh, an impulse is sent to our respiratory muscles that will create an inhalation. And what it does is it takes your diaphragm muscle, which is right below your ribs, right? It's like an inverted bowl right there. And when it contracts, it's, the diaphragm muscle is sort of shaped like a bowl. And when it contracts, it actually flattens out and gets lower down this way. And what that results is in is more room in your thoracic cavity. Okay? It increases the volume. Now, well, again, what happens when we increase volume? What does that do to pressure? Lowers it, right? So we are dropping our diaphragm by contracting it. Okay? We are increasing now the volume in our thoracic cavity. On top of that, what we also are doing, especially when we breathe in a lot, is... Our, our rib muscles, our intercostal muscles are sort of anchored farther back here so that whenever they contract, they actually pull our ribs out a little bit. Okay? So our, our whole entire rib cage and our, our diaphragm lowers, our rib cage sort of expands. All of that adds to increasing the volume of our thoracic cavity, okay? giving our lungs now more room to expand and giving them more space, thereby dropping the pressure that's inside of them. Right? We can actually drop it by doing those things, drop our internal pressure below atmospheric pressure. When we do that, gas comes rushing in. That's an inhalation. When we decide to breathe out, what we do is we relax those muscles. Our diaphragm muscle now relaxes and goes back to its bowl shape. Our intercostals come back in, and we compress that, and we decrease the volume. What have we done in so doing? Increase the pressure, right? We actually, in that case, have now increased the pressure beyond atmospheric pressure. So the air now flows from here to the environment. That's how we breathe. Um, it's a little bit different than what most people think about breathing, but that's, that's exactly how it works. Uh, so that pretty much explains all of that. This is interesting. Anyone in here dive, scuba diving, ever been? Anybody snorkeling or anything like that? Um, really cool. Uh, if you ever get a chance to do that, I, I recommend it. Even if you don't get to dive, you can go snorkeling places. I, uh, I went to... Uh, a few years ago, I visited my friend in Taiwan, the Taiwanese, and he took us to a place that uh, only their natural people, their inhabitants of, of, of their citizens actually travel to. Generally, it's, it's a place where foreigners, when they travel to Taiwan, don't generally go to this place. 
like where they were going on vacation. Um, <clears throat> it was a little island off the southeast coast of Taiwan called Green Island. Beautiful. It was an undisturbed habitat where only native people lived there. Um, and there was like a political prison that was there and it was still being used, I guess. But um, like the roads just turned to paths that go through the woods and stuff. And it's, it's really cool. But anyway, we got to go out and we got to snor- uh, we, we got to dive on uh, this little this little reef that was out there, and it was uh, a beach very unlike what you're used to. It's like an igneous rock kind of beach. All the black rocks were kind of just sticking up all over the place. You had to like step over them, and all kinds of cool stuff. But you get out there and there's like these little pockets that form. You can jump down, and it was the most incredible experience in the world. Um, it's like when you dive down and you go down there, it's so bright, and it's so clear, and so clean. And I, I felt like I was in, like, a National Geographic episode, you know? Like, all those colors. Like, you imagine watching those things on high definition, right? And all that kind of stuff. It was just amazing. I was, like, right here, just touching. One of my biggest fears, by the way, since we're sharing therapy session, um, one of, the biggest fear that I have is swimming in the ocean, which sucks because I love biology. I love marine life. Um, I can dive, and snorkel. That doesn't bother me because I can see it. But when my head's just bobbing above the ocean, it freaks me out. I don't know why. It just does. So that reminds me of a 18 years old. Me and some buddies took a trip down to Panama City. Nothing good comes out of this, by the way. Um, <clears throat> we were out there on the shoreline. If you've ever been there, I don't know if any of you have or not, but um, there's a sandbar a good ways out that people can swim all the way out to, and then they can play frisbee on it, football, whatever on the sandbar, who knows whatever they're doing out there. Um, but they, uh, they knew that I was terrified of the ocean, um, or at least of, of swimming out there suspended in this area. Um, so we're all like, let's go out to the sandbar. And I was like, all right, all right, let's go. I, I can do this. You know, I'm not scared of hardly any, many things, but that, that gets me. So we take off, and then I'm, I'm swimming out here. The waves are crashing in, and then all of a sudden, everybody starts screaming. All my friends start screaming. And they throw their hands up, and they all just fall underneath the water. Everybody's, like, screaming, splashing around. And they're screaming, like, jellyfish, jellyfish. And they're screaming. I freak out, man. I turn around, and I'm body surfing back to the, back to the shore. And I'm panting, and I get there, and I turn around. And there they all stand on the, on the sandbar out there laughing. Yeah, it's real freaking funny. <laughs> Scared me to death, man. But <clears throat> anyways, but I love, like, the aquarium and stuff, you know, if, um, I don't know if, if it's still there or not, but if you got anybody ever go to Gatlinburg, I don't know if you guys ever make, take a trip out there or not. It's a really cool place, but um, they have a Ripley's Aquarium out there. And the last time I was there, they had a, a tank about as big as these tables that you could walk through that had horseshoe crabs. And I don't know if you've ever seen them. You probably don't appreciate them like I do. But um, horseshoe crabs are amazing because they're like this little, they look like a little army helmet. And they got a long tail, kind of brownish. But they've remained unchanged for like 200 million years. They're the same fossils that have been dated back that long, this same species is, is, is still still here. And it's amazing how well adapted they are to the ocean environment. Anyway, you can pick them up and play with them and stuff. And you need to go check them out. It's a really cool place. And if you're ever an educator or anything, you can get in free sometimes. So, so I brought in like six people. Um, anyways, back to my point here with diving. Um, if you've ever dove... Even in a pool, I guess, you know that the farther down you go, the more pressure is exerted upon you. Um, Boyle's Law comes into play here. Um, diving can get very dangerous. If you go down too far, you know, you, you start exp- getting up to about 100 feet or so, you start experiencing a lot of pressure, and you have to be trained in how to ascend, descend, know your dive tables, know how deep you, know, you are, what kind of pressure is going on around you, because if you don't, you could hurt yourself very seriously. Um, so the people who do this, these deep water dives, I know everybody watches like Navy SEALs and all these, uh, even underwater welders and stuff like that that are really cool. Um, these are cool stuff, but there's a lot of training that has to go into this. And, uh, you don't have to know theoretical chemistry, but there's certainly some common sense things you need to learn. Um, but one thing to point out is that every 10 meters you go below the surface of the water, that's about, what, 30 feet or so? Every 30 feet or so you go below the water, you double well, you increase your atmospheric pressure by one atmospheric pressure. Uh, for example, what that means is if I'm at the surface and I'm feeling one ATM as I'm floating there, if I drop 30 feet, I'm now feeling two ATM, twice as much as what I felt at the surface. If I drop another 30 feet, I'm at three ATM. 
I'm feeling three times the pressure as what I would feel at the surface. So you get that one ATM increase for every 10 meters that you drop. Um, now, what that does is, is pose some interesting problems because look at this bullet here. If your tank contained an air at one ATM pressure, like we have right here, you wouldn't be able to breathe this air. If you, had it, if you just took this air, put it in a little bucket, put a cap on it, like you have it right now, jumped into the water, went 20 meters down, you couldn't breathe, even if you have a nice tank of air full of it. And the reason is because of pressure differences. You cannot breathe unless you can create a pressure difference where you, to create air to flow. Okay? Realize that when you're that far down, look at these arrows. What that means is this 3 ATM of pressure is pushing on you from all directions. Your lungs, your body can't expand. Nothing about you can move unless you can overcome at least three ATMs of pressure. So if you're going to create a situation where air is going to flow in, you're going to have to have air in your tank, for example, that is greater that, that right at probably three ATM so that you can then fluctuate it and cause it to come in. Because you've got more pushing on you. In other words, it would create exhalation, basically, is what would happen. Because if you've got air right here that's one ATM, and you've got this pressure in here forcing gas out of you at a pressure of 3 ATM, you're not going to be able to inhale. Air is not going to travel that way. It's going to travel that way, out of you. So what you need to do is pressurize your air so that the container that you have, in this case, is definitely greater than 3 ATM, right? So that whenever you start doing your physiological functions, you can cause the air to flow from a higher pressure into a lower pressure. So that 3 ATM needs to become your lower pressure, in other words, in that case. But obviously, you can't just load up your tank and put it right at 3 ATM because you don't know where you're going to be. You don't want to breathe 3 ATM air if you're at the surface, right? Because you're going to be able to inhale and never exhale. It's going to keep blowing you up like a balloon. It's going to come in too fast. So how do you control this? Well, generally what happens is you take your tank and you pressurize it at a certain pressure that will you know, be more than enough of what you need for any depth that you go in terms of pressure. Then there's another piece that's on here or not. Um, yeah, here it is. There's another piece on your tank that's a regulator that goes up here. Um, and you can see that. You know, that part, the cool part. Um, and what it does is it adjusts the delivery of your tank according to the pressure that's going on in your environment. There's a little diaphragm that's right here in front of the mouth so that whenever that air is coming in from the tank, it will be pushed in a certain amount based upon the pressure that's in the water. And it will adjust the flow so that your, your tank air is actually delivered at the same pressure as what the surrounding water pressure is delivered. So that way, you can control the movement of the air by just your normal respiratory functions. And then you can drop it enough just to make it come in. Does that make sense? Do you see what I mean? It's a little bit confusing. But the point is, you know, when you, when you change these depths, you have to be able to control. Uh, you have to have pressurized air, although you're not going to be able to breathe. Um, now, keep one thing in mind here. Imagine this. Um, let's say you're down 20 meters below the surface, and you're at... Uh, 3 ATM, and you suck in a big breath of your, of your uh, air from your tank. And you, you get freaked out because Jaws is swimming by, and you hold your breath, and you kick it to the surface, and you swim really quickly. What do you think is going to happen? Well, assuming that you could never vent, sure, like if you had your, if you had your every orifice in your body clogged and sealed up, Yes, your, your lungs could explode. Um, and think about why. Because at 3 ATM, that's a lot of pressure inside your lungs, right? If you go up where that, and you've got a certain volume associated with that pressure, if you shoot up to the top where all that pressure becomes three times less, right, that gas is going to expand, right? We know that Boyle's Law says pressure and volume inversely proportional, right? So if volume, sorry, if pressure decreases, what happens to volume? increase, right? So that means your lung volume is going to continue to increase and explode, damage alveolar sacs at the minimum, um, impede breathing, definitely. More likely what's going to happen, though, is your lungs aren't going to explode um, because more likely what's going to happen is you're going to have continually exhale the whole way up. You're not going to be able to breathe in. So let's hope you're not very far and hope you can make it fast. But it is going to be dangerous. You can damage your lung. You can damage your lung tissue doing this. Uh, but realize that as you shoot up, as that is expanding, you just your lungs are going to respond by continually exhaling and pushing all of that out. You're not going to be able to make it up all the way up. Okay. <clears throat> um, 
And that brings you know, a couple other things, too, is um, you, know, you can get oxygen toxicity. You want to make sure that you don't breathe in pure oxygen when you go on a dive because uh, we don't breathe in pure oxygen out here. So we don't, 20%, realize that, about 20%, let's say, is oxygen in our environment. So we breathe one ATM, but we're not breathing in one ATM of oxygen, right? We're bringing, we're bringing in, breathing in about 0.2 ATM because 20% of that one ATM is all that oxygen comprises. So your partial, what's called your partial pressure of oxygen is only about one-fifth of the total atmospheric pressure. So you, what you would definitely not want is to be below the surface of the water breathing in three ATM of pure oxygen. That will, that will harm your body. That's too much oxygen. It can actually cause uh, oxygen toxicity. It's almost like a, if you start getting that, people will get kind of loopy. You can actually get with too much oxygen. It can make you a little giddy, uh, almost like you're drunk underwater, that kind of stuff, which may sound cool, but I assure you when you're 30 meters, you know, you're you know, 100 feet below the water, that's not cool. You don't want to be drunk when you're down there. Um, <clears throat> but anyways, there's a lot of neat things that go along with this. Um, the bins, you ever heard of like nitrogen narcosis in the bins and things like that? The air is mostly nitrogen. Um, and we do the Lewis structure for nitrogen, right? How many bonds is in N2? Do you remember? If I had two nitrogen atoms stuck together to make a diatomic nitrogen molecule, there's the triple bond, right, holding them together. That makes nitrogen very unreactive. Um, it stays together as a gas very well. So when it's in our body, generally when we breathe it in, it kind of just gets, stays in there and gets breathed out. We don't absorb a lot of nitrogen from the air because whenever something goes into our blood, it has to stick to something, and oxygen will stick to hemoglobin, right? Nitrogen doesn't really. It kind of just gets in and out, that kind of thing. Realize, though, if you're way down low and you breathe in pure air with a lot of nitrogen content and the pressure increases, you are forcing nitrogen into your bloodstream just by, by virtue of the fact that you've got three ATM you're breathing in. You're forcing this into your bloodstream. And nitrogen gets in your bloodstream, which, okay, fine. We can deal with it because as long as there's a high pressure pushing down, it can stay dissolved in your blood. It's not that big of a problem. But it can be because especially if you ascend very quickly, the pressure that was holding that nitrogen in now is alleviated. And what do you think happens whenever you take something and alleviate the pressure off of it? Uh, it doesn't stay dissolved near as well anymore. It sort of bubbles out like a gas. So it's almost like you get little bubbles that form in your blood from the, from the nitrogen that is now not being held within your blood. because it does, It's not going to dissolve very well because it's a triple bond held together. There's no bonds that are going to break very well for it to react with anything to dissolve and get pulled apart. So it's going to come into little gaseous pockets. And if you have little gaseous pockets, little bubbles of nitrogen floating around in your blood, that's like a blood clot all over your blood supply. It can cause stroke, it can cause tissue damage, it can cause a lot of things to happen. So when you dive down deep, you don't want nitrogen in your tank. You take a mixture, I want to talk about a little bit later, but what's called heliox. You'll take helium, which is an inert gas, mix it with the proper amount of oxygen so that the only thing you're breathing in is oxygen and helium. You don't talk underwater, so it doesn't matter. No one's gonna, you're not going to sound like a chipmunk. So. See if you can figure this out. Let's say that I have a tube, and I have a balloon on either side of the tube. Okay, And there's a little bit of air that's trapped in it. Enough to make them taut. I blow them up just a little bit, stick them on the end. There's air here, and it's a really long tube, say 30 feet long. Okay, And I turn it up, and I stick half of it down inside the water, like these arrows show, half of it sticking out. What do you think will happen? Air will go up. What do you mean? What will I observe? What visual effect will I see? Okay, I'm hearing a few different things here. Someone give me something. One of you. I just heard too many things at once there. The one on the bottom would deflate. Okay, in turn, then what would happen to that? What would, what would happen? What happened to this guy? Yeah, that's what would happen. The pressure difference is so great that, remember, since we've got a sealed tube here, and this can give, the pressure is a lot greater down here. And we know the air flows from a high pressure to a low pressure. So if I create an area like this that has a high pressure, the air is actually going to flow up that way, right? And it's going to actually sort of inflate that balloon a little bit. Probably not blow it all the way up, but you'll see it inflate a little. So I ask you then, is that possible? If you're at 20 meters, about 60 feet or so, could you build a snorkel and breathe all the way down if you wanted to explore at the bottom of this little place that you're in? Why not?
Why? What's wrong with the air from the outside? The, the problem that we have here is that we've created a sealed system, right? Think back to this balloon thing that we just talked about. What's going to happen? What, what is the pressure of this air right here? 1 atm. At 20 meters, what's the pressure this guy's feeling? 3 atm. Right. All of his air would go this way. None of it would come in this way. It's not going to be possible to snorkel at a depth of 60 feet. Interesting. This Paleolithic Pleistocene fish down here. I don't know if I ever caught one of those. I think one too. Okay. <clears throat> An example here, mathematical. Now we got to get into the math. We understand sort of what's going on, but it's all about the math. If you had a cylinder equipped with a movable piston, and you're right now pushing down is a pressure of 4 atm and a volume of 6 liters in here. Okay. If I take this, it says, what is the volume if the applied pressure is decreased to 1 atm? In other words, if I change from pushing down with 4 atm and instead only push down with 1 atm, how will the volume change? That piston is going to raise. right? You can see that that's going to happen. Less force pushing down means it's going to bob up a little bit. So what's going to happen to the volume? Is it going to increase or decrease? It's going to increase. Okay. Now, now it's a matter of mathematically, to what point is it going to increase? Keep track of our numbers now. Okay. So we have a, a P. This is our P1, right? Our starting pressure. This is our starting volume, V1. Our final pressure is P1 or P2. Sorry. I want to know what is the volume if so a new volume that's going to be V2. So we're going to use Boyle's law, which is P1V1 equals P2V2. We're going to solve. We're going to know three of those variables. We're going to solve for the one that we don't know. So the key in these problems is writing and identifying what variables you have. Label them as PV1, P1, v, or V1, V2, P2, whatever. Figure out what you have. That's what I've done right here. That's the most important step in this problem. Then it's just plug and chug. Plug in numbers, chug out an answer. Here's our equation. Okay. Now, I ask you though, this is where algebra is required. I don't need a proof. I don't need some factoring equation. All I need to know is if I'm solving for V2, how do I rearrange this equation to solve for V2? Okay, divide what? So divide both sides by P2. Is that what that translates as? So go like this. Is that right? Okay, so what would that leave us with? These would cancel out, right? So I'd have V2 is equal to P1V1 over P2. Okay. Easy enough? Now, as you will see here, I'm going to skip over this and I'll talk about it here. You're right. That's how I would manipulate this equation. You're going to have to manipulate equations like this. I'm not going to get too much more difficult than this, but now when we put in our numbers, what we have to make sure is that things cancel out. Okay? If I would have had two different pressures listed, if I would have had millimeters of mercury there and ATM here, I can't cancel those out. So what would I have to do? Convert it. Doesn't matter which one I would convert it to. You probably want to always use ATM if you can. Okay? Because in the future you'll see why. But just get used to using ATM. Convert everything to that. Um, here we can get two of the same, we'll cancel out, we're left with whatever the unit is here, our answer will be in liters. Okay? So in this case, 24 liters. Now that makes sense. This was an easy math problem, if you did it in your head, because if you look up here, <coughs> note, <coughs> excuse me, notice that I decreased my, my pressure by a factor of 4. Right? I went from 4 to 1. That means my volume should have increased by a factor of 4. I went from 6 times 4 is 24 what I got. That makes sense in my head. Those are nice numbers. Realize that in real life, you don't get those numbers. So that's why I want you to see the math behind it, the actual equation steps. Okay. Questions about this before we move on? I wanna, still want to talk a little bit more because we've got a lot of slides on this. Okay, but you'll start seeing that the, the patterns repeat themselves in terms of these different equations. Okay, <clears throat> going back to something that you should have remembered, um, Kelvin scale, remember? We talked about Celsius and Kelvin. 
Kelvin was important because it doesn't have negative numbers, right? Zero is where it stops. Remember I talked about absolute zero? <clears throat> and I said that absolute zero is a theoretical temperature at which everything ceases to exist. I'll show you where that number comes from, okay? How they even came up with it. How do we know that that might be true? But first, um, if you see the word, if you hear me reference standard conditions, as we get in with all these gaseous changes, um, chemists, physicists, what have you, need to have a reference point. Because we know now that if the pressure changes, if the volume changes, whatever, your gas is going to change a little bit, right, in terms of its other parameters. So if you're going to be comparing the, uh, the effects of, of uh, if, you're comp if you're talking about oxygen, and you want to say, well, I found this to be true about oxygen, the gaseous oxygen, and another person says, well, I found this to be true. You've got to have some common ground. You've got to compare apples to apples. So we're going to refer this back to what's called standard conditions, the baseline at which these measurements are taken so that everyone can compare the results and know that this is not based upon anything else but actual true chemical properties of, of the substance. So this common reference point is called um, standard conditions. The standard pressure, for reference, is what you feel now, 1 atm. Fair enough. That's easy to remember. The standard temperature is 0 degrees Celsius. Also easy to remember. Um, it's the same thing as 273 Kelvin. This is called STP, standard temperature and pressure. So if I say you have 4.5 liters of oxygen at STP, what is blah, 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 and realize that there is data within that abbreviation STP. You know what I'm telling you. I'm telling you 0 degrees Celsius, 1 atm. That's what is implied by that. So make sure you pick up on that. OK, one of the things that we said was there's a relationship between pressure and temperature, right? The, the hotter I get something, what will happen to the pressure, do you think? Assuming that the container is fixed and can't move, the pressure will do what? Increase, right. Let's say, though, that. The container can change its shape. It's like elastic. So that means the pressure can be held constant. If the pressure starts to build, it'll just expand and adjust to that pressure. So the pressure doesn't actually build on the inside. It stays the same. Let's say we have like a balloon or something like that. And now I want to look instead at temperature and volume. If I increase the temperature and, and give something space to expand, what should happen to the volume? It will also increase. Okay. If I take temperature, pressure is constant. It's allowed to do whatever it needs to do. It's not fixed. If I input temperature into something, I should see a volume expansion because those things are spreading out. Okay, that's what this basically says. <clears throat> so an example of this, you can do this at home if you want. Show your family, kids, whatever. Um, I've got a lot of these. I've got, I've got a whole book. If you ever want to do any cool diet science demonstrations, just let me know. I've got a whole book of stuff on um, the, uh, you can take a balloon, blow it up, put some boiling water on. Uh, you could probably just leave it in the pot on the stove. And, and instead of submersing it in there, you could probably just hold the balloon over the top of it. But if you take a balloon that's got a little bit of air in it, put it over the top of boiling water, heat it up. You don't want to burn it. Obviously, don't put it on a flame. You'll just pop it. But, uh, let it get warm. And when it does, you should see a volume expansion. Also in physical science, it's called thermal expansion. Things expand when they get warmer, okay? as long as there's no pressure restrictions. And in this case, there's not. So you should see a volume increase. The balloon should blow up. Take that same balloon, dip it in some, or put it in some ice water. What you should see is that since the temperature is decreasing, volume will decrease as well. So you should see it shrink all the way back up. Another way to do it is uh, if you don't want to use boiling water or whatever, you could take a uh, like a one of those glass pop bottles or whatever. You could take a balloon and put it around the end, or if you have glassware like I have, a little flask. Maybe you all have glassware at home or whatever. Um, you could put it on a hot plate or a burner and then let it stay sort of uh, hanging to the side a little bit. And then as the air in the container warms up, you'll see the balloon start to stand up. Okay. Um, ice water, then you take that, put it in some cold water, you'll see it fall back down. Uh, anyways. If you want to create a hot air balloon, you can do that at home too. Um, if you take this balloon and hold it there for a minute, turn the toaster on, let it get good and warm, let go of it, that balloon, because of the heat, there's no air current coming out of here, but the heat will heat up this balloon to the point where the volume expands enough 
you had the same amount of gas molecules in it, right? When it expands, remember that density is mass divided by volume, right? So if you have the same amount of mass, but your volume has expanded, your denominator and your density got bigger, so your density got smaller, right? You have now decreased the density, and the, and the density of the air in here is less than the density of the air out here. So when you have two things together with different densities, the one that has less is going to float in, inside of the thing that has fewer, that has a greater density. So that's how hot air balloons work. You heat it up, that's why there's that little fire underneath them. You heat it up, get that warm, it expands a little bit. A little bit of volume change means a density change as well. So it can float through the atmosphere. Now if you put enough balloons on here, you can probably get your toaster to float. It'd be kind of cool too. Never tried it. Now I think I'll have to. I got a new fancy toaster too, a big one, so I'll have to get a lot of balloons. Okay, this brings us to Charles' Law. Charles' Law basically says that, vol like what we've just been saying, volume is directly proportional to temperature. When temperature goes up, so does volume. When temperature goes down, so does volume. Um, that's assuming that the amount of the gas doesn't change and the, con and the pressure is constant. When you're working through these problems, if you see something that says, assume constant pressure or assume constant temperature, something like that, what that means is those variables will not appear in your work anywhere. Okay? You will not have to calculate for them. You can ignore them is what it means. Um, for example, when you say P1, V1 equals P2, V2, that is assuming that temperature is constant. Remember, you, see, you don't see the T on there anywhere. Because what happens is the temperature is the same on the left side of the equation as it is on the right side of the equation. So they just cancel each other out. No one has to worry about it. Okay? It's held constant. Same thing here. You don't see P in this equation because it's constant. It doesn't change. It is allowed, when that thing is allowed to expand, the internal pressure, because it's able to expand, doesn't change. So it's held constant. So as T increases, V also increases. Now, you want, this is where we're going to start really wanting Kelvin. So get, get in the habit at this point, always using ATM and always using Kelvin as your temperature scale. So what that means is this is our equation now for Charles' Law. V1 over T1 equals V2 over T2. I'm going to show you some more of these, and it's going to, you're going to think, how am I going to remember all these? I'll show you a, a shortcut, a cheating way to remember all these whenever we're done. Right now, I'll just be able to use them. So we have to be able to rearrange equations here. So this is interesting. This is where absolute zero comes from. Um, notice the, the plot of volume versus temperature for, in this case, three different plots of oxygen at different pressures. Okay, notice that it doesn't matter what pressure we pick. Different masses, different pressures, doesn't matter. Um, here's a different gas altogether. This is to show you something very interesting. As you plot these and you keep track of the temperature and the corresponding volume change, like we were just doing, like in balloons and stuff where pressure is constant, what you will see is that when extrapolated, when you take these and extend them beyond, connect all these dots, notice they all meet in one space at one point. Every, every time, no matter what it is that we do, no matter what the gas is, no matter what the conditions, when you're evaluating only volume and temperature, all of these lines converge onto one theoretical point. What that means is that there is a theoretical point because of extrapolation. There is a theoretical point at which the volume is zero. If something has zero volume, that means it's not there. That means that there's no matter there to take up space, and thus does not have volume. So that is the point at which things cease to be in terms of matter. They cease to exist. That's called absolute zero. That is defined as, in Kelvin, that's zero. Nothing can be below that zero because nothing exists below that zero. So that's what's nice about the Kelvin scale is that we will always have a positive number whenever we're dealing with something and won't screw up our calculations. That corresponds to a negative 273 degrees Celsius. Okay. Interesting stuff. That, that's where it came from. Now, is that extrapolation safe? Well, one of the questions you answered in that lab was, was pointing out the problems with extrapolation. You know that it wasn't within your data set, so it's not completely safe to assume. But it is very interesting, given the fact that every single line that we extrapolate lands on the same point. Um, that's probably more than just coincidence. Now, no one's actually ever achieved absolute zero. Some of these physics labs now are getting very close with manipulating the pressures and, and all of these kind of things and 
these conditions to create such a cold temperature. It's, it's a temperature that's a problem, trying to create such a cold temperature to see how that works. But they're getting there. Um, who knows? Maybe they'll, they'll reach it. What that means for quantum mechanics and everything else, who knows? Maybe it'll change everything. <coughs> so that one's for you. OK, so Charles Law. We know that there is a relationship between volume and temperature. I just mentioned absolute zero. Skip over that. Here's a guy who, William Thompson, the Lord of Kelvin. I want, I want this title. I want to figure out how I can get knighted in my life right, so I can be Lord Brinson. I want to put it on my syllabus and make all my students call me Lord Brinson. <laughs> Pardon me, Lord. Um, <laughs> anyways, you can look at some of his data and see how he arrived at sort of the same thing. This is just to show you how it was determined. I already told you that. So I'm going to give you this example, and then we'll end on this. Um, Charles Law, volume temperature. Here's what we've got. A sample of a gas has a volume of 2.80 liters. Temperature is unknown. So already we have, what is this variable? What would we label this as? P1, T1, what is that? V1, good. That's V1, right? What is unknown temperature? What does that mean? That would be T1, right? But we don't know what it is, so that's what we're solving for probably. Question mark there. When the sample is submerged into ice water at 0 degrees Celsius, its volume decreases to 2.57 liters. So what's this? T2, what's this? V2, good. So what was the initial temperature in Kelvin and in Celsius? Okay, so I want, I want both of those. It should be pretty simple. It's plug and chuck. Just rearrange your equation here. Notice on this, sorry, notice on this, like you said, we've labeled them like, like you told me. I wrote a little t here because this is in Celsius. I want you to use Kelvin uh, for your calculations. Then you can back convert the Celsius to give me your answer if I want it in Celsius. Okay. Um, all right, so what you're going to need to do then is take your equation, and we are solving for, what does it look, look like, what, T1? We're solving for T1. How am I going to do this? How do I get T1? by itself in this equation. Multiply what? Tell me what I'm multiplying by. Tell me my first step. You told me what it was going to be. Tell me what I can do right now. Multiply both sides by T1. Okay, I can do that. That means these guys cancel out, right? So there's what I've got so far. Now what do I do? Anybody? I'm looking for a T1, right? <laughs> Therein lies the problem. Okay, I can do that. Or if I want to keep things simple, for people who might not have got all of that, multiply both sides by T2, right, first. If I, what if I, remember, it, you can play with this equation all you want. It doesn't matter. As long as whatever you do, you do it to both sides of the equation. Okay? Um, so if I multiply in this, here's what, what I would do in this case. Um, I brought my T1 up here. I would now multiply both sides by T2, because when I did that, those would cancel out. So now I'd have T2 over here. Right? So now I've got T2V1 equals V2T1. Now I just got to divide both sides by V2. I've got my equation. So it looks like V1T2 over V2 is equal to T1. Right? No? <laughs> if you got lost on that, my friends, that is, I mean, I'll help you as much as I can, but realize that between now and the next time we meet, that's something that you're going to need to know how to do, or you're going to get lost in this math. Okay? You need to be able to, and that should have been a requirement coming in here, you need to be able to rearrange algebraic equations to solve for different variables. I promise you that you will be sorely, sorely hurting if you cannot do that before the end of this chapter. So between now and tomorrow when we meet again, learn that. Okay? <clears throat> Hit the math tutor. You know, come into my office, find somebody in the class or whatever. It's actually not that hard. You should be able to get the hang of it. But um, it should be something that you should know how to do at this point. I don't see how you passed algebra and didn't learn that. But 
You never know. So we are solving for <clears throat> T1. I'm going to rearrange, plug in my numbers. I want my temperature to be in Kelvin. So here we go. What I've done is now taking my Celsius that I have, convert it to Kelvin. That's this step right here. So I've got 270, T2 is 273K. Okay. So this is my equation. I've rearranged it to solve for T1. Okay. So I'm going to plug in V1, which is 2.8 liters. T2, which has been converted now to 273K, divided by V2, which I have up here, 2.57 liters. Notice that cancels out. I'm left with Kelvin. Okay. That gives me 297K for my T1. Notice, always pay attention to what I ask. In this case, I do want the in Kelvin, but I also want it in Celsius. How do I convert that to Celsius? I subtract 273 and I've got it in Celsius. Okay, so that's, whoops, sorry, that's this one. Okay, so also 24 degrees Celsius. That's about what you feel right now. 25 degrees Celsius is about room temperature. So, questions, comments, complaints, praises, especially the latter? No? All right, we'll start with the combined gas law next time.